on this Tuesday night, landmark judgment. A top European court rules Switzerland's climate inaction violates human rights. This is only the beginning. The potential implications for other countries. Top aides to the Prime Minister testify at the foreign interference inquiry and dispute what the head of CSIS has said. There was a mistake made. In the U.S., the first parents to be sentenced for a mass shooting committed by their child. You failed as parents. The harsh words from victims' families. And the nature of things. They were basically asking, what just happened? How animals reacted to Monday's total eclipse. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. For the first time, we're getting precise details about what Prime Minister Justin Trudeau knew about suspected foreign interference in the 2019 and 2021 federal elections and when he knew it. Dozens of documents labeled secret or top secret were entered as evidence at the inquiry into foreign interference today. And as David Aiken explains, the Prime Minister's top aide testified about when Justin Trudeau was briefed about potential security breaches, including involving allegations against a former Liberal MP, Han Dong. Justin Trudeau was in the midst of campaigning in the 2019 election when he was first told about potential irregularities in the Liberal nomination race in the riding of Don Valley North. Liberal campaign director Jeremy Broadhurst briefed the Prime Minister personally after security agencies had briefed party officials. I think that the leader of the party should be aware of them. No action was taken. That 2019 nomination race was won by Han Dong, who would then go on to become the MP. The public would not know about allegations of Chinese interference in Don Valley North for more than two years when, in 2023, Global News and the Global Mail first reported on them, citing national security sources. Global News also reported that Dong had a telephone conversation with a Chinese diplomat in Canada. Global cited national security sources that said in that call, Dong had suggested the release of the two Michaels, then still in captivity in China, be delayed. Shortly after, Dong resigned from the Liberal caucus and now sits as an independent MP. Dong subsequently sued Global News and rejects the allegations reported by Global. Dong has insisted that he always advocated for the early release of the two Michaels. The Prime Minister's top aides told the Inquiry Tuesday that when the Dong stories first appeared, they wanted to publish the full intelligence about that phone call Dong made but we're told they could not do so for national security reasons. We couldn't actually, um, in a clear way, defend and defend Handong against this allegation, which was wrong. Intelligence officials testified last week that their summaries about this call came with caveats that they could be incomplete or may need further context, but they did not describe the summaries they provided as wrong. Trudeau's closest aide, Chief of Staff Katie Telford, testified Tuesday that at one meeting last year, intelligence officials did concede they were wrong about an intelligence assessment. And there was one instance uh, that's referenced here where there was a mistake made, where a, there was a, um, a threat linked to an MP that didn't seem right. She said security officials subsequently reversed that assessment. Now, was that assessment about Dong or was it about someone else? That crucial bit of information cannot be put on the public record by the inquiry or anyone else for national security reasons. Donna. All right, David Aiken in Ottawa tonight. Thanks, David. Israel's prime minister says no one can stop his plan for a ground invasion into the southern Gaza city of Rafah, where more than one million Palestinians are sheltering. <laughs> There is no force in the world that will stop us, Benjamin Netanyahu told new army recruits today. He is still vowing to eradicate Hamas. Israeli officials claim today the amount of aid arriving in Gaza has significantly increased. The UN disputes that, saying many of the trucks Israel allowed in over the last two days were only half full. Israel has been accused of using food as a weapon of war, and UN agencies say all evidence points towards an acceleration of death and malnutrition in Gaza. Canada promised to help get some relatives of Canadian citizens out of Gaza, but even the federal minister in charge admits that temporary visa program has failed. The government says 108 people who have managed to get to Egypt from Gaza did so without the help of the immigration department.
Heather Yorks West has the story of one family's harrowing experience. Hello. That's everyone. <laughs> After six months of terror and loss, it's a beautiful sight to behold. This is Akram. Hi. Uh, Tamar Jarada's sister, Ashan, his wife's sister, Asma, and their six children away from the war in Gaza in Egypt, where they will be safe. What was that first phone call from Cairo like for you? It was full of screams, um, laughs, and we also cried uh, a lot. <laughs> The war has left no room for life in Gaza, Jarada's sister Ajan tells us from Cairo. I lost all my family. I have no one left. Gaza is now a graveyard in my eyes. In late October, Tamar and Ashan lost their parents, two sisters, and 13 other family members in an Israeli airstrike. Ashan and her children were then forced to flee to the refugee tents of Rafah. She was pregnant at the time. Can you ask your sister about what it was like to to bring a child into this, to give birth in, in these conditions? She says, never in my life did I imagine the baby I had waited nine years for would be delivered in a hospital with no disinfection, no sanitation. I was given stitches without anesthesia. I felt as if my soul was leaving my body when the doctor was stitching me up. With newborn baby Adam sick with an infection and the threat of bombs and hunger all around, Gerada was desperate to get his family out. But with the Canadian government unable to secure safe passage out of Gaza, Gerada had to turn to operatives from Egypt for help. We were left with only one option, which is taking uh, this matter into our hands and uh, technically buying our family's lives. At a cost of $69,000 and counting, money the family has had to borrow and fundraise, 10 of Gerada's 17 loved ones are now safe and awaiting their Canadian visas to be approved. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. In the U.S., the first parents to ever be held criminally responsible for their child's mass shooting were sentenced today, and they faced families of the victims in court. Jackson Prosco on the heart-wrenching moments and the message this landmark ruling sends. It is the sentence of this court that you serve 10 to 15 years. James and Jennifer Crumbly were each given nearly the maximum penalty for involuntary manslaughter. Repeated acts or lack of acts that could have halted an oncoming runaway train. In court, families of the young victims delivered emotional impact statements. I remain a shell of the person that I used to be. They explained how their world was shattered when 15-year-old Ethan Crumbly opened fire inside a Michigan high school in 2021, killing four and wounding seven. I was forced to do the worst possible thing a parent could do. I was forced to say goodbye to my Madison. Crumbly pleaded guilty and was sentenced to life. His parents were later charged for failing to lock up the handgun he used. Both were found guilty. This could be any parent here in my, up here in my shoes. The trials focused heavily on whether the Crumblies did enough to address their son's mental health issues. I was not aware of, or that he was planning, or that he obtained access to the firearms in my house. The groundbreaking case is described as a rare instance in which a school shooting could so easily have been stopped. What these families have gone through, and it is preventable. Though the Crumblies are expected to appeal, their trial could be a roadmap for future prosecutions of parents whose children engage in gun violence. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. The federal government has committed $500 million to help community organizations in Canada provide young people with mental health support. We want to make sure that it's a full continuum of support for particularly young people when they need the trust, they need to build uh, safe spaces for themselves that don't always come in the traditional methods that, um, of health care service providers. The Youth Mental Health Fund will be handed out over the next four years. It is the latest in a string of campaign-style announcements ahead of next week's federal budget. And I will host a live special when that federal budget comes down Tuesday, April 16th, right here on Global and on all our streaming platforms.
There is a big legal victory for those pushing governments to reach their climate targets. Europe's top human rights court has ruled the Swiss government violated its citizens' human rights by failing to do enough to tackle climate change. At the same time, temperatures around the world hit an all-time high for a tenth consecutive month. Data from the European Union Climate Agency shows global air temperatures reached an average of over 14 degrees Celsius last month, making it the hottest March on record. Sea temperatures also hit an all-time high, just over 21 degrees Celsius. A group of 2,000 women in Switzerland made the case that heat waves linked to climate change are affecting their health, and today they won. Redmond Shannon explains the ruling and its implications. With their blue scarves, these Swiss women say they have taken a step toward realizing a green goal. We can be very proud. The court has recognized us and our fundamental right to a healthy climate. Known as the climate seniors, they took the case to Europe's top court, arguing the heating planet is affecting how they, as older women, can live their lives. The court found Switzerland's inaction on climate violated the women's human rights. This included a failure to quantify through a carbon budget or otherwise, national greenhouse gas emissions limitations. The respondent state had previously failed to meet its past greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. It is the highest court to hand down such a ruling. We take this obligation seriously, but we need time to examine which measures could be proposed. The women admit that the harshest impacts of climate change will come after they die, but say they are doing this for future generations. The ruling coming on a day when scientists revealed that last month was the warmest March on record, the 10th such monthly record in a row. The court rejected two similar cases on Tuesday, but those plaintiffs said the ruling on the Swiss case gives hope to them and other campaigners. This means that we have to fight even more since this is only the beginning, because in, in a climate emergency, everything is at stake. I think this is a, a huge moment for all of those communities in the 100 cases or so around the world who are taking their governments to court. Similar cases are proceeding in Canadian courts, but the climate knows no borders. Many more rulings such as this may be needed to force worldwide collective action. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Urging change after a tragedy. Coming up, the push for Edmonton to reform its animal control bylaws. After an 11-year-old boy was killed in a dog attack in Edmonton, there is heated debate underway about accountability for pet owners and the city's animal control bylaws. Ethu Garcha reports on the urgent calls for reform. A family's grief echoes through this quiet Edmonton neighborhood. Cash Grist was visiting his father for spring break when tragedy struck on Easter Monday. An autopsy confirmed his cause of death was a dog bite. So I was just walking across the kitchen and that's when I found him. Wesley Grist described his son as a gentle soul who adored his father's roommate's two Cane Corso dogs who have since been euthanized. I watch these dogs cuddle with them almost every day. The fatal attack has ignited a debate over animal control bylaws and safety. I would never normally put my son in a situation where I thought he was going to be hurt. Cash lived with his mother in Asuyas, B.C. She spoke with Global News by phone a few days after her son's death, saying she was surprised to learn the dogs had a history of violent behavior. I had no idea. If I would have known, I would have never let him go. The city of Edmonton confirms there had been multiple complaints about the dogs, including two reports of attacks this year. The dog owner knew that these dogs had uh, harmed um, other other people in the past. Personal injury lawyer Raj Bogle says he represents a woman who was attacked by the same dogs in February. She has at least two fractured ribs, uh, a punctured lung. Global News tried to contact the dog owner but has not been able to reach her. To be candid, it really needs an overhaul. Canadian animal law expert Jennifer Friedman says the wording of Edmonton's bylaw is confusing, making understanding rights challenging for both enforcement officials and dog owners. 
as a lawyer, I had trouble following that particular bylaw. There are a lot of things that are missing that are present in many other bylaws across Canada. She says the city is faced with a critical opportunity for reflection and action to prevent such tragedies as a heartbroken family prepares for Cash's funeral on Sunday. Neetu Garcha, Global News, Vancouver. The railroad company Norfolk Southern will pay $600 million to settle a class action lawsuit over a fiery train derailment in Ohio. The spill of toxic chemicals in East Palestine last year was extensive. Hundreds of residents had to flee and there are concerns about long-term health effects. If approved, this settlement would resolve all class action claims within a 20-mile radius of that derailment. It would also resolve personal injury claims within a 10-mile radius. Norfolk Southern says it is not admitting liability or fault. Mining minerals for EV batteries still ahead. What Canadian industry leaders say they need. The federal government wants every new light-duty vehicle sold in Canada by 2035 to be electric. There are questions about how to achieve that, including what it will take to maintain a steady supply of batteries. As Mike Jorlet explains, getting there will require heavy lifting from Canada's mining industry. It isn't called a gigafactory for nothing. The Justin Trudeau Liberals bet big with a retooled auto industry. The promise? Jobs. And not just at massive EV battery plants in Windsor and St. Thomas, Ontario. The big picture saw manufacturing complemented by indirect jobs in the mining industry. Because all the minerals needed for EVs, including lithium, known as battery white gold, are right here for the taking. When I talk to government officials and when I talk to the mining companies, you know, I really stress that if we don't do this right, what we fail to do today will come back to haunt us. The first part of the retooling strategy, the EV plants, is nearing completion. The second part, the mines, looks less certain, in part due to the financial markets. Over the past couple of years, the price of lithium is down a staggering 81%, cobalt 64%, and nickel 41%, dampening the mood of investors looking to build mines. And unlike the heavily taxpayer-subsidized battery manufacturing plants, the mining industry is on its own. Canada's 2022 critical minerals strategy suggested the industry look to the private sector for investments. It would be disappointing if we don't build out the supply chain, but I, I think we can and we will. It will take a lot of political will and it will take capital. But when? It's been two years since the first EV plant was announced. Minister of Energy and Natural Resources Jonathan Wilkinson says the support is there through a critical minerals fund and tax credits announced in last year's budget. But as of today, no money from the fund has been doled out and the tax credits aren't yet available. Those are in the process of actually being finalized now and, uh, and they will be available uh, within the next number of months for companies that actually want to make those kinds of investments. While many companies are waiting for a financial boost, Rock Tech for One is betting big on a lithium price rebound. We have a, a mining project that requires a couple hundreds of millions in order to get into production. And then the refining side of things, here we're talking one to one and a half billion Canadian dollars to get that into production. When the Red Rock, Ontario plant is up and running, it will be the first lithium mine in the province, but it alone won't be able to put a dent in demand. And for, for lithium, there's two options. Do it yourself or get it from China. International support was expected for the first few years. The question now, is independence still attainable? Mike Drolight, Global News, Toronto. Tomorrow, Mike looks at the long process of importing lithium into Canada and the concerns that could drive up the emissions EVs aim to reduce. Animal instincts next, how the total eclipse affected the behavior of animals. There is some new cash in the UK. At Buckingham Palace today, King Charles came face to face with his own image on banknotes. The King's face replaces his mother's image on new 5, 10, 20 and 50 pound notes. They go into circulation in June. Existing money with the late Queen's image will remain in circulation too. The Bank of Canada says the design process is underway here, but it will be several years before the King is on our $20 bill. 
Well, you know, millions of humans were captivated by the total eclipse yesterday. And of course, we know what's going on. But what about animals? Suddenly, their world goes dark in the middle of the day. Researchers at a Quebec Zoo decided to keep a close eye on 15 different animals to see how they behaved. Mike Armstrong reports on what they observed. How much time did you spend here yesterday? I was here for three hours. He snuck out every once in a while to peek at the sky. But during the eclipse, Pierre Chastanet's focus was on Granby Zoo's macaque monkeys. They didn't do much of anything, he says, until about 10 minutes before totality. As it got dark, they gathered together the way they always do to sleep. Where it got interesting was when it suddenly got bright again. They were not animated. They were very calm, very still. They didn't move, but they were yelling, you know, with whatever they were saying in their macaque world. Now, the zoo's observation teams were out again Tuesday. They're watching 15 different species. They did two days before the eclipse, and they're doing two days post-eclipse. That'll give them the baseline to determine how the animals normally behave and if anything was different during the eclipse. Well, most animals didn't have any reaction, but two that stood out were zebras and ostriches. Shastana has a theory that they may have instinctually felt in danger from predators when it suddenly got dark. We saw in the zebras, for instance, that uh, they went galloping around their habitat. Uh, they were yelling a lot. What do you think, Alta? Now, there are stronger reactions being reported out of other zoos. Animals were more agitated as the eclipse reached totality. But other zoos were open to the public, and that likely affected the animals. Humans during the eclipse tended to get quite excited. What we were able to do is have a real observation of natural behavior of animals during an eclipse, and not animal behavior influenced by human behavior during an eclipse. Chastanet has about 50,000 data points to analyze and weeks of work ahead. But his preliminary findings are that some animals react to an eclipse as though it's nighttime, others don't react at all, and in both cases, within minutes, everything's back to normal. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Granby, Quebec. That's Global National for this Tuesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is Canmore, Alberta. We'd love to see your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. And thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye-bye.